Our next unit is about forces, and the most important scientist for this unit would be Sir Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton was born in a farmhouse in a tiny village in England in 1642, almost a whole year after Galileo passed away. A premature baby born to a newly widowed mother. He was so small that his mother said he could fit into a quart jar. This baby was not expected to live, but he grew up to be one of the world's greatest scientists. When Isaac was young, he showed a great deal of interest in doing things with his hands. He made a working model of a windmill, water clocks, and a stone sundial. He loved reading and copying of drawings. After his stepfather passed away, his mother pulled him out of school to be a farmer. But the young Isaac proved to be inadequate at farming. When he was supposed to work on the farm, he would read, daydream, or make wooden models. So finally his mother gave up and sent him back to school and then college. Newton studied at the famous Trinity College at Cambridge University for four years. Soon after he got his degree, Cambridge had to close because of the Great Plague. So Newton went back to his mother's farmhouse. The 18 months he spent at the farm were probably the most fruitful in science history. We don't know if there was really an apple that fell on his head, but he sat under an apple tree a lot. He devised the basic laws of mechanics and applied them to heavenly bodies. He invented the methods of differential and integral calculus and used the calculus to help him discover the fundamental laws of gravitation. He also studied optics. Do you know what one of his greatest contributions to optics is? When he shined light into a prism, he found that white light could be separated into all the rainbow colors. Newton was only 22-23 years old at that time. But for some reason, he did not publish his wonderful discoveries until almost 20 years later. It was the famous astronomer Edmund Halley who convinced and supported him to publish his findings. Now, we're going to start with the Newton's laws of motion. Back in 300-something BC, Aristotle thought that a force was required to keep an object moving along a horizontal surface. To make this thing move across the table, I would have to exert a force on it continuously. If I stop pushing, it stops. Or, at least, it eventually stops. Aristotle said the natural state of a body is at rest. So, without a force, the object returns to its natural state and stops moving. Then, about 2,000 years after that, Galileo reasoned that, yes, if I stop pushing, this thing will come to rest. But uh, it's for a completely different reason. What do you think is the reason? Galileo thought it was because of friction. He recognized friction as a force, just like a push or a pull. He argued that if you can make the surface smoother to reduce friction, like this wet bar of soap, a moving object will continue to travel for longer before coming to a stop. He even imagined that if one can have completely smooth surfaces without friction, an object in motion will keep moving at the same velocity along a horizontal surface without slowing down. To Galileo, the natural state of motion is constant velocity motion. For an object that stays at rest, its velocity also stays constant, a constant zero velocity. Newton's first law of motion built on Galileo's idea. The first law says, if the net force on an object is uh, zero, we use capital F for force. Net force is the same as the sum of all of the forces acting on the object. If the net force is zero, 
an object at rest would stay at rest. An object in motion would continue to move at a constant velocity. Which means uh, same speed, same direction along a straight line. So in order to change the object's state of motion, there has to be a non-zero net force. The tendency of an object to maintain its state of motion is called inertia. So the first law is also called uh, the law of inertia. Now, about inertia. The higher the tendency an object has to maintain its state of motion, the higher its inertia. So what exactly is inertia? What do you think is the closest thing to inertia? One of the things I often hear in students' answers is momentum. Although we haven't learned about momentum, we can probably all agree that a train at rest has zero momentum. Does that mean it has no tendency to stay at rest? Of course not. It would still be very hard to change the train's state of motion and make it move. So even when it is at rest with no momentum, a train still has a large inertia. So what do you think is the closest thing to inertia? The closest thing to inertia is mass. So it is much harder to change the velocity of a heavy train, not hard at all to change the velocity of this toy car. Now let's try this puzzle. I have a one kilogram dumbbell hanging here. It's tied to identical strings. I'm going to pull on the bottom string. I'm just going to pull on one of these. Which of the two strings will break first? The top one or the bottom one? Okay. Let's see. The bottom one broke. But uh, let's, if I pull a different way, let's. Now the top one broke. The first time, I jerked the string and the lower string broke. The dumbbell is heavy with large inertia, which means it has a high tendency to maintain its state of motion to stay at rest. So when I jerked the string, the dumbbell did not have enough chance to change its state of motion. So it stayed at rest and the lower string broke. To be more specific, when I jerked the string, the extra tension from my pole does not immediately transfer through the dumbbell and reach the top string. So the lower string broke. The second time, I pulled with a steady force to allow enough time for the extra tension from my pole to reach the top string the top string broke because the top string was under more stress than the lower string. The lower string was only under my pulling force, while the top string had to experience my pulling force and to support the dumbbell's weight. The first law also explains how these tablecloth pulling tricks work. Just like dumbbell, this glass bottle filled with liquid has relatively large mass which means a large inertia. So it has a high tendency to stay at rest. That is why when I pulled the paper underneath quickly, it nearly stayed in place. But of course, if I pulled with a steady force, the bottle would move with the paper. Here's one more puzzle for you. I have this heavy low friction card and a steel ball that can go into the cylindrical cup. Inside the cup, there is a spring that you cannot see. I can compress the spring and lock it in position with this key. 
when I pull the key out, the ball gets shot straight up. And what I'm going to do is, I'll do it on the floor. I will push this card to give it an initial velocity while grabbing onto the string. As the card goes, the string will pull the key out and the ball gets shot into the air. My question to you is, will the ball fall back into the cup or will it fall in front of the cup or behind the cup? So the ball fell back into the cup. In this case, both the heavy card and the heavy steel ball have large inertia. With friction and air resistance being relatively low, their net force in the horizontal direction is almost zero. The ball's motion does get affected by the spring's force and gravity, but the both of those are in the vertical direction and therefore have no effect on the horizontal motion. So both the cart and the ball have constant velocity motion in the horizontal direction. And since the moment the ball gets shot, the ball has the same horizontal velocity as the cart, the ball and the cart would have exactly the same horizontal motion. That's why the ball falls back into the cup. So, thanks to the law of inertia, if I jump up, the spinning earth will not cause this wall here to slam into me. Because although the earth is spinning, so its velocity is not exactly a constant. Because uh, if you're doing circular motion, your direction is changing. That means the velocity, which includes speed and the direction, will be changing. But we are on a very big earth, so the curvature of our circular motion is very small. For a huge circle, our path is almost straight, which means that we are almost doing constant velocity motion with the Earth's spin. So, my house is like the cart, and when I jump up, I'm like that ball that's shot upward. And luckily, I land right back here instead of having the wall moving and slamming into me. The first law also tells us why we don't feel velocity, but we feel acceleration. I can be traveling at a very high constant velocity and not feel it at all, because this is my natural state of motion. As long as the net force on me is zero, I would keep going at a constant velocity. But if I'm in a car accelerating forward, my body would tend to move at that old slower velocity. So I tend to fall behind and therefore, relative to the accelerating car, I would lean backwards. On the other hand, if the car slows down, the acceleration would be back that way. While the car is slowing down, I still have the tendency to keep going at that same old velocity. Therefore, relative to the slowing car, I would lean forward. So the first law, the law of inertia, explains why we lean in a direction that is opposite to the direction of acceleration. I hope you like this fourth stuff. We will talk about the second law in the next video.